All right, it is now uh, a real privilege for me to introduce our speaker for tonight. Normally, this is where I would speak, but as we were preparing for this conference and, and what we felt the Lord was doing this year and wanted to do, I could not think of anyone better than Carter Conlon to come and speak tonight. Pastor Carter, Pastors Times Square Church, which was founded by David Wilkerson, that is the author of The Cross and the Switchblade, um, and Pastor Carter was the number two to David Wilkerson, walking in his shadow, content to do so. And when I first met Carter, I'm not sure how many years ago, I immediately connected with him. You know, those men that you just have, they've got the heart that reflects Jesus. His background, we have a similar background. He was a police officer in Canada, got into the ministry and was there serving David and the, and the congregation, but he has a heart of prayer. And, and he, is a, he is a prayer warrior, and he's leading a prayer effort around the world. But not only is he a prayer warrior, he is a servant, serving the people of New York City. I, I had the privilege of preaching in his church a, a couple of months ago, and Times Square Church, it's an a historic theater right there in the heart of New York, and it's an amazing place, amazing service, and, and it was, you know, he, he's right there at the, I mean, he's I, right at the gates of hell, I would think, <laughs> but he preaches the Word of God. It was funny, he, he told me, now, don't be disturbed if people walk out while you preach. Well, I'm not, because that happens all the time, <laughs> but after the service, he looked at me and said, he said, wow, you just had a few people walk out. I have twice as many every Sunday walk out on me. <laughs> it's because he preaches the word of God. But yet they are seeing revival in their church. The city is opening the doors to them in so many different ways because they're willing to serve the community. A few years ago, with the resources they had, they had the opportunity to, to begin doing satellite churches because they had gone way beyond their ability in their church. Well, instead of creating satellite churches, what they did is they partnered with the churches that were already there, sowing into their ministries, giving food so that they could help the poor in their communities and build up the pastors in these small churches. <laughs> giving hundreds of thousands of dollars to these churches. And now, through the authority granted to him by serving, they now gather these pastors and they pray for New York City. He is carrying a message from God. He is a man of God. And I'm grateful that he is one of the watchmen on the wall of our nation. Please welcome the pastor of Times Square Church, Pastor Carter Conlon. Good morning. Praise God. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very kind. I'm glad you stood before I speak because you may not stand after. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for your presence here tonight. We thank you, God, for how you have been speaking to us so powerfully all day. We recognize that we are a nation in trouble, but you are calling us as men and women of God to stand in the gap. You're calling us to stand there righteously. Men and women who have a heart for you, not playing games with you or your kingdom or your people or your truth. And so God, thank you for examining our hearts with your truth today. We bless you, Lord, for those that you love, you chasten. You tell us that no chastening for the present time seems to be joyous but grievous, but nevertheless afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So we love you, Lord, for speaking to us, and we thank you, God, for all that have spoken this day, the courage that it has taken Pastor Tony to address the topics that have been spoken about in the realization that you have given us an open window as a nation, and now you're calling us as men and women of God to rise up and take our rightful place 
as the heralds of your truth. Father God, in Jesus' name, I ask you, Lord, to invade this room. I ask you, Lord, to tear down everything that needs to be torn down and build up everything that needs to be built up. I ask you, Lord, for genuine humility to touch each of our hearts. For you told us, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And so, God, we just curse the roots of pride that would try to keep any of us to hold on to a sense of righteousness that is not conformed to truth. Help us, Lord, in our weakness, for we recognize that without you we are nothing. Without you we are just voices without power. Without you we can't pray, we can't preach, we can't teach, publish, or defend, God, what we have not fully embraced ourselves. So give us the grace tonight to respond to this initiative, Lord, your yearning for us to rise up again as your church and your leaders. Father God, my voice is worth nothing, but yours can create a universe. So I'm asking that I may have the privilege of disappearing, that you would take this frail body, you would overshadow my weakness, and it would be your mind, your thoughts, and your heart that would be conveyed to your people. I pray, Lord God, tonight for the pastors that are here and for the Christian leaders that in every stage, even those who are leading their home, I pray, God, for a touch of heaven to come upon all of us, a courage, a passion, a power, something of you, Lord. I ask you for the grace to look outside of our own struggles and trials that seem to want to preoccupy our time. I ask you to give us the eyes to see that those that nobody else sees in our society. Give us the passion, Lord God, to get our children out of the grip of hell. And Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for this moment. We ask you, Lord, to protect our president. We ask you to protect our present government. We ask you, Lord Jesus Christ, to keep this bulwark in place for this moment while we prepare. Because, oh God, ultimately, the future of the nation is in our hands. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. I was, just as a sidebar, I was reading today in the scriptures in the book of James chapter 5, where James says, confess your trespasses or your faults in the original King James to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Confess your faults one to another. There's, there's nothing in pride but powerlessness. There's, there's nothing there. There's no reason to hold on to it. It's simply an illusion of power. It's an illusion of walking with God. And pray that we might be healed. And then he gives us the illustration of if we will walk in righteousness, we are declared, of course, to be righteous through Christ, but there has to be a manifestation, an outward working of, of that righteousness. It doesn't mean that you and I are perfect in all things. It really just means that we have a hunger and a desire to be the man or woman that God has called us to be. As Paul said, I, I may not have achieved, I may not have attained, but I'm leaving behind what needs to be left behind, and I'm moving forward to this high calling of God that's on my life in Christ Jesus. Now, after James says these words, he gives us an incredible illustration. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave fruit, and the earth produced its fruit. And as I read this in the context of a complete thought that James is, the Lord is speaking through, through James, it's an incredible thought that God says, I took, I, I had a crisis in a nation. There was a crisis. The whole of God's people at that time were being led astray by false thought, false theology. They, they, they had left off the worship of the true God, and they were captivated, and they didn't even know it. And I needed somebody that could make a difference. So I took a man, the Bible calls him just an ordinary man with his struggles just like we have, but obviously a righteous man, obviously a man who wanted to walk in truth, yet as every other person, not without fault or flaw or struggle, but he had that inner desire to walk in truth, and God raised him up at a crisis moment in the nation and gave him power in prayer that could stop the rain. In other words, God says, I wanted 
to find somebody I could work through to do what only heaven can do. And I think you'll agree with me tonight that we're at a moment in the history of this nation that only God now can make a difference. And I'm really thankful that we're there now. Only God, only God can make a difference. Only God can push away the darkness. Only God can give us the victory. Only God can bring our children out of the captivity that seems to have surrounded them and this generation. Only God can bring back righteousness again inside of our borders. Only God, only God, only God. And he's looking again as he did through the prophet Ezekiel. I didn't want to have to judge the nation. So I sought for someone to stand up in the gap and couldn't find anybody. Isn't that a tragedy? Couldn't find a single person among the most religious people on the face of the earth at that time. May it never be said about you and I. May it never be said that God passed by our church looking for a righteous man or woman of God and couldn't find anybody that would stand in the gap and be the person that he had called them to be. Now, I want to talk to you for just a moment about three prayers that changed, that delivered the city. Three prayers. Not long prayers, but they had incredible power because there was a life behind those prayers that God could work with. And that's what I believe that the Lord's been trying to speak to us all this day today. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 6. And I'm not going to go into the whole scenario, but suffice to say, there was a city. There were walls around the city people of God of that time were dwelling inside these walls. And beginning at verse 14, it tells us that the king of Syria, the enemies at that time of, of the people of God, the enemies who always want to come in and captivate and swallow the testimony of God, that is our fight. That's the fight we've always fought. That's the fight we're fighting today. It's the fight we will fight tomorrow. Now, while the people slept, in verse 14, it says, the king of Syria sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now, I just think about, for a moment, the people inside the city, they feel comfortable. They've got a history. They have the prophet Elisha there with them, for example. They, they, there is a semblance of spirituality in the city. They've, they've, got the, they've got all the testimony of their past, and I'm sure they're enjoying themselves, and and while they were enjoying themselves and while they slept, stealthily an enemy came in and surrounded them at night. You know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not anti-church and I'm not here to beat on anybody or anything, but realistically, while we slept as a nation, while we failed to take the stands that we ought to in many cases, the enemy came into the borders of this nation by night and surrounded the city. So we find ourselves in a very, very similar situation. As a snake, he slithered into the wombs of the nation and began to murder the children. The devil always goes after the children, you know that. All throughout, he went after the children under two in Bethlehem to try to get a hold of the Christ. He went after the firstborn sons in Egypt, throwing them into the river. You'll see the pattern all the way through scripture. And while we slept, as a church age, as, as a generation, or maybe a little more than that, the enemies slithered in first to the wombs and began to murder the children. What a tragedy that is. Not content with that, he slithered into our grade schools and began to gender confuse our children and lie to them about many things. Then he went into our high schools and told our high school children, you cannot pray, you cannot do this, you cannot speak about God. As a matter of fact, there is no God, so don't even bother speaking about him. Not content with that, he went into our colleges and began to radicalize our young people in the nation, our future leaders against both God and country. Not content with that, he went into the homes and began to divide and destroy the homes. Not content with that, he began to redefine family and marriage in the nation. Not content with that, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And a servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? The first person to arise and realize the situation was, I call him the chariot counter. 
a natural man. He sees with natural eyes. He, he reasons with a natural mind. He crafts a natural plan. And he's the first one up. He looks over the wall and he starts counting. One, two, three, four, all the chariots. Turns around, looks at the resources inside the city and comes to the conclusion, we're done. We're finished. The enemies that have gathered around us are more and mightier than we are. They are too strong for us. What are we going to do? If all we see is in the natural, if all we can do is count our statistics, then we will always come out just like the ten spies that went into the promised land and will come to the conclusion, we're done. We can't win this battle. The second man to rise up was a spiritual man. And some of us have arisen up, and God has given us the understanding of the hour we're living in, and we, we can quote the statistics, we can read the books, and, and we all know how difficult this day is. We all know that the enemy has crept in. He's surrounding our cities and our homes and our families and our children. We all know that we're in a very, very perilous moment in history. We know that. That's what the natural man can see. But thank God, by the power of God's Holy Spirit, and by the strength of God's word, we are not destined to live there. This is not our inheritance. This is not our heritage. We still have the God of all this universe sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, whose name is above every name that will ever be named. Everything is under his feet. Everything in this world is in subjection to him. And so Elisha answered, and said, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now we see the first prayer that Elisha prays. He said, I pray, Lord, open his eyes that he might see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. This has to be our first prayer. God I don't want to live in the natural realm. I don't want to live in that realm where I'm guided by just what I think and I see and I feel. I'm not called to live there. I'm called to be more than a conqueror through Christ who lives inside of me. I have the living God inside this earthly temple. The living God who created a universe by his spoken word. The living God who can raise people from the dead. The living God who can calm the sea and calm the storm. The living God through whom all things are still possible. <laughs> Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 beginning at verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. My prayer for you and for my own heart is that, oh God, as you once did with Abraham, would you lift my head again? Would you help me to see things that are bigger than what I can see with my natural eye and perceive with my natural mind? Would you, would you give me an understanding again that you are God and there is no limitation to what you can do. There's no limitation to who you are or what you can accomplish through my life. And so the scripture says, when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord. Now the first prayer was, give this man sight, open his eyes that he might see. His second prayer is for the enemies of the people of God. He said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now, that blindness doesn't necessarily mean they couldn't physically see. He was really praying, confound them, confuse them, don't let them achieve their objective, Con confuse their pathway, don't let them go 
where they have planned to go. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We have power in prayer, my brother and my sister. We're not victims on the sideline watching history go by, powerless to change it. No, there's still power in prayer. We can still believe God for a spiritual awakening in our nation. Give me one good biblical reason why we can't believe it for a spiritual awakening. Unless we choose to stay in bondage, unless we choose to live in the flesh, unless we, we choose not to ask for spiritual vision, unless there's no authority in our prayers because there's no truth in our lives. And Elisha said to them, this isn't the way, nor is this a city. Follow me, and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. And so it was when they had come into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they might see. His third prayer. He only prayed three prayers and delivered a city. Lord, open the eyes of my servant that he may see the host of heaven that's with us. Lord, blind the eyes of our enemies that they may not perceive or realize their objective. And now he prays, Lord, open the eyes of our enemies that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw they were inside Samaria. In other words, they had been taken captive, not by an army, not by a strategy, by one man who knew how to pray. One man. Remember, the effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man or woman avails much. Elisha was a man, or Elijah, like we are. Elijah was. And he prayed, and the, the rain stopped to bring the people back again to the worship of the one true God. And once they began to worship again and they said, the Lord is God, then God answered his prayer again and sent the rain. The Lord opened their eyes and they saw they were inside Samaria. Now when the king of Israel saw them, this is a type of a man who still walks in the flesh. He said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those who you've taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared a great feast for them, and after they ate and drank, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of the Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. And this is the heart of God, even for our enemies, the one who commanded us to love our enemies. No, it's, it can't be in your heart to do violence. It's in their heart, but it can't be in your heart. You take them captive by the power of prayer, by the power of God. And when they realize they've been taken captive by something greater than themselves, something greater than their own objectives, then set the kindness of God before them and send them home to think about their ways. Send them home to think about what they're doing, how they've been living. We have power to take this generation captive for Christ. Did you know that? We have power to believe God for a spiritual revival in the nation one more time. We have power to trust that God can bring into our congregations, into our churches, into our ministries, anybody and everybody of every walk and persuasion of life and watch the uh, conviction of the Holy Spirit come upon their lives. Watch the tears. I love watching the skeptics come into Times Square Church and people who are even hostile to what we do. I love watching it because as we begin to worship, as the Word of God is preached, they come in and they fold their arms, and you can tell there's anger there. They don't want to be part of what's going on. But in almost every case, after just a little while, you see the hand go up and start wiping the tears off their face. And they don't know why they're crying. They're crying because they've been taken captive by a power that is greater than anything that they've ever embraced. I, we've been watching God do just absolutely phenomenal things. I can't even begin to explain all of it just as we've gotten together and pray and, and believe. I have one prayer that I pray constantly now, and it's simply this. Lord Jesus Christ, if people go to hell in New York City on my watch, let it not be because they've never heard there's a Savior. 
Let it be because they chose hell over heaven. And God has been making a way in the airwaves and the radio. Last year, this is, this is almost hard to believe, but last year the New York Mets asked me if I'd throw the opening pitch for their ball game against the L.A. Dodgers last August. And the owners of the Mets said, after the game, we will invite the people to stay and you speak to them, whatever you want to speak to them. <laughs> after the game, 5,000 people stayed, 300 publicly gave their lives to Jesus Christ. You never know what God is going to do when you and I begin to reach out to the poor, the afflicted, the addicted. We walk, choose to walk together in unity as the body of Christ. We pray together. We ask God to do what we can't do. I still get together every month with the pastors, the hundred pastors from Feed New York churches, and we pray, and we've never had a plan and still don't have a plan. We say, God, reach the city. We believe you can. We believe you will. We believe you'll reach our communities. We ask them to turn the worst of the worst in our inner city schools into evangelists that will be fearless and stand in their schoolyard and preach the gospel of Christ. We ask for prayer meetings to break out in our colleges and our grade schools, even in daycare. We ask for God to send his Holy Spirit and bring revival. We're recently being flooded with uh, young people in their 20s starting to come in from everywhere, from every walk of life. We have a seeker's service now at 1 o'clock, and we're getting upwards of 350 to 500 people who do not know Christ coming in, asking questions. It's truly amazing what God is doing. People are not afraid of truth. This generation is not afraid of truth. They're searching for it with all of their heart. Would you pray? Would you be willing to do a few things with me tonight? Number one. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. Don't let the devil get advantage of you any longer. Humble yourself in the sight of God, the scripture says, and he will raise you up. I have a gentleman that travels with me when I um, go to different places quite frequently. And last night I, I shared with him some things that in my life where I felt the devil was trying to get into my mind and discourage me. And, and we prayed together. And after we prayed, I, I told him, I said, I feel so good. I feel free. The enemy was starting to get an inroad in, about some things in the church, some, some problems. You ever had problems in the church? Anybody here? Is that just a New York thing? or you know? <laughs> you know, I just was getting down about some things that we have to face and deal with. And uh, the devil was trying to get into my mind saying, you know, it's your leadership. It's your fault. And these things didn't have to go this way. And you're deficient, et cetera, et cetera. And, and um, one time I was in uh, Nigeria with Brother Chooks and we were about to, uh, Brother Chooks was an ambassador from Nigeria at one time, and he stayed here in the country after his term was up, and we were in Nigeria, and uh, there was about a half a million people going to be gathering at night for three nights, and they were in a civil, a state of civil war, and I, I just suddenly got overwhelmed. I said, oh God, I'm way in over my head. I mean, they've been in quarantine, they've been not quarantined, but they've been confined to their houses for uh, about six months, and this is their first ever public meeting. The last time they were together in public, the nominal Christians and Muslims, 6,000 people died. And so here I am, the, the, the catalyst of bringing these people all together into one location. Uh, after the first shot is fired, there's going to be a bloodbath here. And, uh, and I've caused this, and I've brought people together, and there's, there's going to be death. And I just started just, oh, God, oh, God, forgive me. And I was laying on my face in my hotel room, wailing before the Lord. Brother Chooks walks in. I just like friends like Brother Chooks. He's an old-time warrior. And he walked into the room and said, what are you doing? No, what are you doing? It's a real deep voice. And I said, oh, I've just I, I made a mistake. I've brought 200 people here. There's going to be people killed. And he looked at me and said, get up. He said, God sent you here to do a job. Get up and get it done. We saw 100,000 people come to Christ the first night. 100,000 souls. God brought peace into that area. And uh, even the governor of Nigeria, who wasn't there during the crusade, he was so taken by what happened, he flew to New York City 
brought an entourage with him. He says, I don't know what you did. He said, but whatever you did, I want that in my life. He said, would you put your hands on me that I could be a follower of Jesus Christ? He, he was unsure of the concept, but I was able to lead him to Christ. And this is the governor. And he saw the power of God, the power of prayer, the power of walking with the brother. We've, we've heard that here. You can't do this alone. None of us can. You, you need a brother. You need a sister. You need somebody you can talk to. Don't try to do it yourself. You just go deeper and down into the, into the spiral. Confess your faults or your struggles. No, it's not always just faults. It's just struggles. It's weak areas. It's just things that are attacking your mind. A feeling of failure because you're preaching the gospel and your own kids are not living for the Lord. It happens. The struggles, the trials that come in, you're telling everybody about this wonderfulness of God. Your own marriage is in trouble. Don't try to fight this alone. God is willing to fight it for you. But it requires a humility to see his power released in your life. And once you begin to know his power in a personal way, then you begin to crave for that knowledge of God to come into those around you in your society. And you begin to say, God, open my eyes. Give me a higher vision than what I've been walking in. Give me the ability to see who you are, what you really did on the cross, and what you can do for this generation. And then you begin to pray that not that the enemies of God would be brought into captivity, not destroyed, not punished, not any violent end come to them, but God, bring them into captivity to the obedience of Christ and help me to show them kindness. In spite of how they treat us, help us to be representatives of the one who went to a cross for us when we were not even seeking him. God, help me to be an ambassador of that kingdom. Would you stand, please? I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands, whether you've ever done that. It doesn't really matter. You're in a safe zone here. If you've never done that before, it won't hurt you. Trust me. Just raise your hands and surrender and say, God, humble me. Help me, Lord, to walk humbly before you and before my brothers and sisters. Give me somebody that I can talk to, that I can pray with, so that I can be free to be the person that you've destined me to be. And once I get free, give me spiritual vision. Give me spiritual authority. Let the miracles of God begin to abound in my life and through my life. And set free a multitude of people all around me, everywhere. There are no borders with you, Lord. There are no restrictions. There are no limitations. You can do whatever you choose to do. This is a desperate hour. And you are looking for righteous people. Men and women of prayer. And I want to be that person. So help me, God, to be the man or the woman that you've called me to be. In Jesus' name. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something. Find a prayer partner just wherever you are, men with men, women with women, or husbands and wives together. And just find a prayer partner right now. And I know how uncomfortable this might be for some of you, but join hands with that, that man or that person and pray for each other right now. Pray. Pray that you might be healed. If you have a need, if you have a struggle, let them know what it is.